Hi, my name is Matt James, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategy and Analytics uh, for Redbox with the Outer Wall business here. I'm with Andrew Thompson, Senior Analyst on our team, and we are back at Tableau Conference in 2013 here in D.C. to talk to you about how we use analytics to optimize our retail footprint, which happens to be the largest retail network in North America. Okay. Hello on the team, strategy and analytics team at Redbox is responsible for the analysis that drives decisions on the most important issues facing the business today. Here at the conference, we'll talk to you about one of these really complex problems we use, our large data uh, as well as Tableau to help us solve. Before we get into the details, we'll give you some quick context on the Redbox business just to make sure everybody's familiar. I'm sure you've seen the kiosk at your local grocery store or Walgreens or CS, but just in case, we'll uh, set the record straight on what the business looks like today and then get into what we're calling our location story or where we are today and how we got here. So about a week ago, we were in San Diego at the Flow Conference, and we talked to you about how we were using big data and analytics to drive rentals, and we just crossed the milestone threshold of two billion rentals. Well, we're back, and we've been busy. Uh, in a little over a year now, we've surpassed three billion rentals, and as you can see here from the chart, uh, just keep growing. And one favorite way to think about that is even though that's a big number, 3 billion rentals so far to date, doing as many as 4 million rentals in a given day. Still, Redbox is a pretty small actual entity. Uh, if you think about the kiosk itself, so that kiosk is, is just about 12 square feet. It's real hard. You can almost wrap your arms around it. It's one of the most productive and efficient retail spaces in America. If you pair the sales per square foot of Redbox here on the left, you see is just about $4,000. For retailers, you know, the other retailers that are in that same ballpark are folks like Apple and Tiffany. And I think we can all agree they're, they're selling things that are a tad bit more expensive than $1.20 a night DVDs. They have a bit of a leg up there on the price point. Uh, and then on the right, you get a sense of just how small that box footprint is. That's us, the little red dot uh, next to these really large retailers who have beautiful and expensive showrooms to, to display all of their wonderful products. So here to talk about our location strategy, it's quite appropriate that it's, it's DC that's hosting the conference this year. DC was actually the first test market for Redbox back in 2003. You can see down there in the bottom some examples of what the kiosk used to look like. You may not know that it didn't used to be just about DVDs. The first box concept was actually a convenience store in a box. So you could get your milk, you could get some eggs, you could even buy a disposable camera, or you could rent a DVD. Now, because it had milk and eggs, that was a refrigerated box, so your DVD was cold. Uh, still played and still worked, and, and in fact, these were worked the best out of all of those products. And so quickly the team pivoted towards focusing on DVD rental. And so now you can see on the right one of the early versions of the red box kiosk. Uh, if you're familiar with our kiosk today, you'll note that it's quite a large footprint and yet a relatively small kiosk inside of it. So that, that kiosk only held about 120 discs, whereas our kiosk today, which are three, four, or five different since then, now hold 717 discs. So we've added a lot of capacity uh, and yet kept that overall footprint very small. So for early testing with McDonald's locations in D.C., we pretty quickly started to expand. And so what you'll see here on the, the map is how we expanded across markets. So you know, from D.C., we go to Denver and Yankee. Minneapolis and Baltimore and Houston, Dallas and Chicago, and then really start to fill in the rest of the country. Uh, if you're familiar with the business day, pretty much everywhere you could shop. Uh, you could say we're ubiquitous even. And with 
37,000 distinct locations and 44,000 kiosks in those locations, it's hard to go very far without finding a Redbox kiosk nearby. Now, that growth in locations will grow in the business, and you can see that on the visualization here on the bottom, which tracks the Redbox share of DVD rental. Uh, so disc. You can see that back in 2007, when we started tracking this, Redbox is barely a blip on there, and that, that market is really dominated by Blockbuster and Netflix and, and other uh, and more stores. And over time, Netflix has grown and then shrunk their DVD business. Blockbuster has pretty much shrunk and is down to 100 stores now from a peak of over 4,000. But Redbox has grown consistently and as of Q2 had over a 50% share of the DVD rental market. Now, in addition to driving rentals and revenue for the business, uh, that's also driven some other things for us. And, and on the top right, you see the expansion of what we call migration. So one of the keys of the Redbox business model that makes it very convenient is that you can rent a disc from any kiosk and return it to any other kiosk. That is a, a really crucial part of why it's you know very easy to use. If, if you had to go back to the same kiosk, you might not be as inclined to take that rental. You know, I, for example, usually rent at work and will return it at a kiosk near my house. However, our customers definitely take advantage of that as well. And what you see here on the chart is that as the density of the network has grown and as we've installed locations all across the country, we've made it easy to do that. And now about 50% of our disks get turned to a different location. The distinction here is that most of those stay within the same market. So most of the time, it's people in D.C. renting a disc and returning it to another kiosk in D.C. The percentage of folks who are taking those discs and migrating them across the country has maintained at a relatively low level over time. So as Matt mentioned in the last slide, that map of the United States is being very filled in. And early in 2012, we started to think about our network and we thought we were reaching scale. And we needed to think about asset productivity, which is not really the sexiest topic, but it's very important for optimizing Redbox's network going forward. And figuring out the productivity of every kiosk is actually very important to assessing how we're doing as a network. And the way that we needed to go about that was to look into the productivity of all of the products in all of our kiosks. That gets complicated because, as mentioned also in the last slide, our consumers are moving around our product constantly. Now, we have almost 28 million disks right now in our network, and each one has a cost that should be assigned to it for any kiosk to carry it on any given day. So, out exactly what the cost of all the product is on any given day is definitely a big data problem. The visualization on this slide shows us the amortize of the product. We want to give value to the fact that it is worth different amounts on different days. For instance, 21 Jump Street, which was the most rented title in 2012 at Box, this nice steep take curve, which shows us that Roughly half of the rentals and half of the revenue that we're expecting to make on 21 Jump Street happen within the first 30 days of it coming out. You can see it when it's out right away at release date, and it slowly makes a lot less money in the back end of its life. So, for instance, on release day, 21 Jump Street might be worth 12 cents in cost to a kiosk. By its birthday, it's really only worth part of a penny. We kind of take this whole methodology, apply to 6,000 unique titles that we've ever rented Redbox, uh, hundreds of amortization curves that cover all the different time periods looking at. And you could say that when we put those two things together, we get the mother of all cost schedules. Now, if we took that cost schedule and joined it to a ton of inventory data, which we collect at a daily level for every one of our 43,000 plus kiosks, get a very, very large number of rows of data. When you combine those two things along with all the really detailed kiosk level accounting that 
explains how much we spend in supply chain and utilities and share with our partners for each of our guests. We took one major analytics problem, and the S and A team stepped up to work on in late 2012. Jump over to we shared that productivity metric with the rest of our organization, which was another great opportunity to use Tableau. So as you saw in the last slide, we're getting parts of pennies. That's a bit detailed. One that we use is Tableau is to roll things up and make it much more easy for the rest of the organization to kind of digest the analytics that we're putting out. And the way that we did that with our productivity metric was to create a real scorecard, which made it very easy for our sales organization to understand how our clients is performing and look at the of each of their sets of kiosks nationally and how they compare over time, as well as whether or not those kiosks are in particularly dense locations. So as we're saying, optimization is a key prior for Redbox uh, going forward. And part of the way that we think about that is how many kiosks you have in any given area. Thinking about those kiosks and what to do, and particularly now as we think about where do we put new kiosks today? We already have almost 44,000 kiosks out there, so you'd, we'd be pretty good at figuring out uh, whether a new kiosk is a good idea. And it's a really simple idea that we use to evaluate these opportunities. However, like many things, when you bring a lot of data and complexity into it, simple idea becomes very complicated to execute. We focus on two important criteria when we're thinking about new locations. Uh, first is, well, how many rentals are likely to generate at that location? And here you see on the left uh, a simple way of how we would imagine that. But there's, there's several factors, right? So how, how a location will perform is going to be a function of, of what account it is for us. For you, that means what store, right? So is it a Walgreens? Is it a Walmart? Is it a regional grocery store or perhaps a gas station? Right? We have kiosks in all of those and then some. No, the Redbox kiosks in certain accounts will perform better than in others. Um, could be the channel. So Walmart kiosks perform differently than drugstore kiosks than grocery store kiosks. Uh, then you have the demographics of the area. So what's the population? What's the education level, the income level, the uh, gender mix, the uh, percent of households with families? All of those metrics can be an important role in performance of a kiosk. And finally, you have the actual placement in the store. You've been to uh, your grocery store and seen the red box kiosk. It was probably inside, either right near the door or perhaps in a vestibule. If you go to a Walgreens, you've probably seen a Redbox kiosk outside. Uh, well, placement differences also drive differences in performance. You, know, you generally want to be near high tra traffic doors and either just inside or just outside, depending on the channel. So visualization here shows a, a hypothetical new location and, and how it compares to all kiosks in the network across those dimensions, and, and both in its very local area or a five-minute drive time, so we can map every kiosk in the network and figure out what's the population, what are all the other kiosks that are within a five-minute drive time. And so here you can see this location, uh, the, the account here is performing you know, very, very well. Similarly, you can look at the whole market, so not just a five-minute drive time, but look at all of Chicago, for example. Uh, and then we can also compare to the overall national average to say, is the kiosk on average going to be uh, better or worse than our average kiosk right now? A lot of math that goes into figuring that out, but this is a nice, simple way to visualize the, the drivers. On, on the right side, you see the other key factor here, which is, is on a free lunch. So if you put a kiosk in the ground today, 
often than not, it, it will cannibalize other kiosks in the network. Um, because the network is as dense as it is with 37,000 locations, um, it's not likely that we're finding completely untouched parts of us. So if I put the new kiosk in, and some customers may shift some of their rental trips from existing kiosks to that new one. It's great, especially if the new kiosk is more convenient for those customers and perhaps makes it even easier for them to rent. Um, however, we need to be thoughtful about what the initial cannibalization is. So it's just nearby kiosks to this particular location and where we expect uh, the likely cannibalization to be. So that thicker line is going to suggest uh, higher cannibalization rates. Um, that cannibalization factor a little bit more, we created a really simple example. So we're calling this our one horse town. It's got one slide, one school, everyone sees each other, and right now it has one red box. The red box is doing really well. It's performing over 150% to the network average. It's time for a second red box. It, it's finding that moment where this town's going to make it. It's going to have two of something. So we'll add another kiosk down the street. Right now, everybody has to go to the Food R Us to get the red box. And go add in. Our expectation for the mega shop is that it's also going to be a very strong performance about 10% better than the national average. But, unfortunately, in life, there's no such thing as free lunch, and Mega Shop is going to do some amount of cannibalization to the food or us that's right down the street from it. So, look at what that's going to... ...is going to have some amount of what we call negative cannibalization or action on order of of found 60% of its over rentals, just go bring it down to being a completely average kiosk. And we'll move that cannibalized business over to the mega shop. Now, and as Matt was saying, the way that we evaluate all of our location decisions is around how many incremental rentals we expect to get out of adding a second location to an area. The Met is going to kick in an extra 50% overall of the business. So this is pretty acceptable. We overall raised kind of the number of rentals in the total area to like 2.1% of the national average for the 1.6 that we had originally. So that's a really good simplified example of how we would think about adding new kiosks to the network and, and estimate the cannibalization to come up with an incremental rental picture. We know that there aren't very many one-horse towns out, out there, and what we're actually doing is looking at uh, an existing network that's already quite dense. And so like any other retailer, you define the trade area for a given store is very important. Um, given our network density, though, how to define it becomes a lot more complicated. And there's several things that we could consider. So you could start with a very simple area. Okay, look, we will say we'll draw a line around this kiosk two miles. So this is a two-mile radius circle around the kiosk just outside of Seattle. Uh, there are our corporate headquarters in Bellevue, uh, the 405 and, and High 90. So we'll draw this two-mile radius and say we expect that the kiosk here will cannibalize all of the other kiosks in this two-mile radius to some extent. And then we would do some math and look at what those other kiosks are in terms of channel and banner and placement to come up with what we think that cannibalization factor is. But we don't think that a two radius is all that reasonable, uh, even we know about our business and how you know, we historically looked at it. So we could take it a little bit more advanced and say, you know, two miles doesn't mean a lot, but what about times. So what if we changed it to a five-minute drive time? Because we think, you know, consumers, you could have the hypothesis, consumers are willing to drive five minutes to pick up DVD, so really that should be your trade area. When you, you change from a straight area to the drive time, 
then you get these squiggly lines. And they're squiggly and bunched and, and extending in certain directions because they follow roads. Uh, and the bigger the road, the farther you can go in five minutes. So here you see in particular, it spreads out across Interstate 90 a lot, uh, all the way out to Mercer Island. And maybe this is the right view. Maybe this means that this is the appropriate area for thinking about cannibalization. And so you see all of those kiosks that are included uh, at five-minute drive time. But then we've done some thinking, and we said, well, why use just a drive time? Right? We have 7,000 locations. We have you know, millions of transactions every day. We have 20 million customers using the network every single month. We let our customers and our transaction data help us define the trade area. So with this last add to the visualization in the green here, you see the actual kiosks that have relationships with the kiosk in question. And some interesting things pop out. Right? There are no kiosks north of Interstate 90 that have a meaningful relationship with this kiosk. So even if they're uh, within the five-minute drive time or within the mile radius, nothing. Nobody's taking anything from this kiosk and returning it in Bellevue. Bellevue is not that far away. Uh, there is a kiosk much farther south that's not in the two mile radius or the five minute drive time has a meaningful relationship with this kiosk. So if we were using a simple one of these simpler methods to estimate cannibalization, we would never even include that kiosk as being relevant. So it really is uh, be careful about how you define these trade areas and, and using this you know tableau visualization to go in and see what's a reasonable trade area. And it's probably not that complicated for everybody in the room to agree that, you know, it's a wonder five minutes probably isn't the right answer because five minute drive times are going to mean different things in different places. We started to use kiosk relationships to look at how our whole network is related. And there's two major factors factors that go into defining a relationship between two kiosks. And overall, when I talk about a kiosk relationship and customer volume, I'm at any rental or return that occurred at a location in question can relate uh, to another kiosk by a customer coming and using the in question and then running returning to another one of these kiosks. I think we always go back to things that we know. When I started to look at this question, I started with my hometown, which is Naperville, Illinois. And I knew something pretty interesting about two red box kiosks that were across the street from one another. And I was very curious as to whether or not they'd be related. And right now is actually 10 weeks of transactional data from one Jewel Oscar store out of Chicago in Naperville, Illinois. And all transactions that Related to that kiosk over the course of 10 weeks during the summer. So even in a relatively sleepy suburb of Chicago, people are really moving their discs. Over to people are moving out to San Francisco, out to Arizona, down to Florida, and it's to see whether or not those relationships are significant. The transactions themselves tell us, hey, I went on vacation and I returned it here. We only know what the transactions can tell us, and so we need to figure out a way to define what's important and what's not important here. The criteria that we looked at was the relationship between two kiosks should really be consistent, meaning people are going and using this dual OSCO and then you're returning to a kiosk week after week. So the first thing we're going to do is just make sure that this relationship is totally consistent. We're going to movement to all these locations in every week that I'm looking at. And this will evolve over time. The thing that I want to look at is, okay, I've got things that are happening every week, but I'm totally interested in other tasks that may have had one or two, even three or four, a dozen different transactions that related to my Jewel Osco that I want to go down to. I have Tableau quite a bit, and one of the things that I use it in data exploration all the time is to simply 
kind of a scatter plot of the data and find meaningful kind of cut points that I can start to draw distinctions between things. And through running through that process quite a bit, the level of significance that I've started to believe in is really 4%. And when I do that, I found my relationships to other kiosks, besides the Jewel Osco that's here in the middle. There's nothing things going on here. There's us right next to each other. And it's not very easy to see this visualization, and I didn't want to crowd it with a lot of other charts, but it's colored on the significance of that relationship, which based on the customer volumes are moving between these kiosks. And the significant relationships are between these two kiosks, the two Walgreens kiosks that are nearby. These point more towards the Naperville and this across the street ends up being the least significant relationship of the five. And that's pretty interesting. Normally we would think that physical proximity is one of the key drivers of creating a relationship between kiosks. But maybe you've been over to a friend's house or some family's house. You've noticed that they don't shop at the same grocery store that you do. That happens quite a bit. People, for whatever reason, sort of self-select to shop at certain retailers, and they don't normally mix that much. If you're a Walgreens person, you're probably not a CVS person. Likewise, if you're a Jalosco or a Super Value person, you're probably not a Safeway person or a Kroger person. And you won't use at two of those locations because they're just not places you would typically go. So these two kiosks are across the street from each other. They do have a significant relationship. A few significant relationship out of the five. These relationships lead to some really interesting things. As you to explore what this looks like, I switch them onto a map. And looking at Southern California right now, more I think you're seeing things that you would expect. The further out of town, the bigger the relationships get in terms of distance. They spread out along the coast. There's not much between the desert and the coast. But one of the interesting things that I found for all, is all the relationships that I've examined in the United States is one right here. A really significant relationship between two kiosks. And the distance that it's covering is unprecedented as far as I've seen. One of our best clients is the Marine Corps. They've been a client of ours for a long time, and our men and women in uniform really love them, some movies. They rate our discs further than anybody I've seen so far. So I did a little bit of research into what it really is over here and over here that was enabling this really significant distant relationship. If you're familiar with San Diego and Orange County, you know that this is Camp Pendleton, just north of San Diego and the smaller base uh, up here in L.A. that they're moving them to. And it's cool to see our customers create these relationships and data really telling that story all on its own. I didn't really have to torture it to tell me that. It just came out and said it. One of the things that we always talk about within the location strategy team here at Redbox is whether our strategies work with lots of different types of geographies. And so looking at relationships has really been revolutionary for us because it really scales to how different all of our locations are. One of the challenges we always put to ourselves is, okay, the strategy makes sense in downtown Chicago where I live, but makes sense in both Montana. So right now we're looking at five relationships that are based on my kiosk, what I call my kiosk, which is one that I live closest to. It's at a CVS on Clark Street on the north side of Chicago, related to Walmart neighborhood market, a Walgreens, a couple 7-Elevens, and a Julasco. All those locations are really within a few city blocks of another. So this really kind of shows you how different a kiosk the micro network is versus someplace like a suburb or someplace much more rural. And drive 
five minutes, I'm not going to drive anywhere. I'm going to walk everywhere. And uh, really explain that. So let's go look at a different place and see what that looks like. coming up on screen now. Spread out. Um, but let's go into Bozeman. Networked area that we're looking into. Let's check out. At one of the Kroger's. And then, um, so recall how zoomed in we were when we looked at my CVS on the north side of Chicago. It was in the significant relationships that require you to get on interstate to get there. Um, so, this is like kiosk relationships and the data scaling from really, really, really local citations that are joined to relate to a handful of other kiosks within walking distance to things like this one in that keeping the product from town to town um, is completely a different dynamic than the one that my CVS has that I go to all the time. So the kiosk relationships that we know about we can look at the transactional data and all this for our entire network and look at it at any given time, like I just did in the last slide. What we're taking it next is to start to predict these relationships and then use that to inform the amount of cannibalization that we expect Alien to have before we even install it. We're going to start to use kiosk relationships to improve what we're doing in site selection. We use that very familiar formula of there's some things about a certain nation that are endogenous to it that make it what it is. So if I'm looking at this hypothetical mega shop, it's grosser, but it's going to be outdoor. We need to count. We probably have other installs, already. and we demographically that this location is you know slightly above average for us. Just given the rows of transactional data we have able to define and watch relationships grow for installs over time, we can go back and use all that data to model what we think will happen for this mashup when we install it. So at this map, we see there's a Walmart right down the street, but not as thick as some of these other lines. The least that's just to the east looks like it's going to be a very significant relationship as the 7-Eleven of the street, which is probably a nice outdoor placement. The word is interesting because I think it makes a lot of intuitive sense. If you go to Walmart for a trip, it's not necessarily something you do nearly as much as going to the grocery store or the drugstore. You tend to form relationships and then spread the product out to the guests around them. But a store trip and a Walmart trip are often mutually exclusive. So the model predicting that that relationship won't be very significant, but Walmart is physically the closest to the hypothetical mega shop, it is going to have some sort of relationship. We're taking our site selection into the future. Um, with you tuning in, Matt and I are uh, thankful we're able to share this with you today. And uh, we'll see you at Tableau.